My name is uh, Daniel Mark Alsa Joseph Stevens. Um, that's the name that was given to me at birth. Uh, it's the one that appears on my birth certificate. Um, I also have my traditional name, which is uh, Keeper of the Down Rivers. Um, it was given to me. We found it through a series of ceremonies I performed and we I was a part of um, early on in my youth at the age of 16 and 17. Um, and I also carry a third name, um, which is my Indian status name, which is 22001818801. And that was awarded to me by uh, and I don't want to say awarded as, as a good thing, but it was, it was the number that they give me um, upon my birth um, because I carry a certain amount of blood quantum because I am from the Anishinaabe of Nipissing. Uh, I don't live on traditional territory. I live in what uh, most Ontarians would call Sturgeon Falls, um, which is just a little north, uh, about uh, 10 minutes north from the Canadian reservation, um, but it is very much uh, within uh, our territory. I'm a, a father of three wonderful children, um, all with their very unique special gifts. My daughters will definitely be taking over the world uh, in the next 10 years. Um, I'm working hard at making sure that they are supported uh, to, to reach any goal that they, they set their minds to. And I have a son who has some very complex special needs. Um, so we have a very unique dynamic here in our family um, and we rely heavily on, on community for those reasons. So that's just a little bit of who I am. And I'm here to talk about sort of social justice and access. Um, and I really, I think it's poignant to sort of, to, to bring up the fact that residential school, we talk, residential schools, especially we talk about um, generational trauma. And it's one of those things that is very difficult for most people to understand and what that looks like. My, my Goldmiss and my Shomis um, both attended residential schools early on in their youth. Um, and what happened because of that changed how our family was going to, to live. They survived residential schools. Um, but it, when they got into their, uh, the, their adulthood, they actually uh, made some very important choices that changed the way our family interacts, even amongst our own nation, my own nation of Nipissing. And I'm going to take you a little bit of on a story here for that purpose so that you can understand that when we talk about generational trauma, we are talking in a very large, broad scope of, of possible scenarios that could happen. But nonetheless, they are existent today. And people live with these problems um, every, single, every single day. So my, like I said, my Goldmiss and Shomis both uh, went to residential school. They attended Spanish residential school. Um, and they, when they got married, um, they had children. Now, my aunties and uncles, the oldest ones, um, actually could have attended residential school, and they didn't. Um, and the reason why was because my Gomez and Shomis would go hide on the island to make sure that they weren't taken away come September. Um, they would go hide on the lake uh, and move every couple of days uh, in order to sort of avoid the Indian agents. Um, later on, my Shomis uh, was uh, disenfranchised, and by doing so, he gave up his status and his legacy and his heritage in the eyes of Canada uh, in order to protect his family so that they wouldn't be, wouldn't be a force to attend residential school. I actually grew up right across the street from the reserve um, on a road that's called Stevens Road because... Once you disenfranchised, your entire family disenfranchised, and they no longer were allowed to live on the reserve and live amongst community and actually weren't even allowed to access community and family. So, the, you know, there was essentially a wall, uh, that road act as a, as a, as a wall there. Um, my grandparents refused to teach Anishinaabe Moen to my uh, aunties and uncles um, because they viewed it as a dirty language. And they were forced to attend uh, provincial schools on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, they lived in significant poverty because obviously looking uh, Indigenous uh, in that time frame, and we're talking early 60s and 70s, um, meant that you weren't allowed, they couldn't find jobs. My Shomis worked as a general laborer through anybody who would hire him to build docks and, and things like that. They would sell fish and whatever they could to make ends meet. Um, Goldmiss never worked. 
uh, and my parents, my grand, my aunties and uncles never learned their language. Um, fortunately enough, they did learn some of their heritage and, and traditional practices, but the vast majority of that knowledge was, was significantly breached, mostly because of the experiences that they suffered at residential schools. So there's always sort of this general distrust that happens. Now, moving on forward, I was born and I don't look Anishinaabe. I, I, I hold a lot from my mother. My mother's a French uh, from French descent. And my grandmother told me uh, a year before she passed, uh, I was a grade nine student in high school. And she took me aside uh, after she had gone to Nashville, which was one of, one of her you know, biggest dreams to, to go to. She took me upside and gave me a $1 bill, an American dollar bill. And she said, you know, Dan, she says, the best thing that ever happened to you is that you don't look like us. That level of self-loathing is something that is very difficult for people to understand. It was something that, was, that didn't strike me right away. It struck me much later on in life when I reflected upon that conversation. It just sort of always stuck with me that my grandmother felt so bad about herself because of what they did at those residential schools, that she, she essentially made the choice to try to make her life better and her children's life better by assimilating. Imagine if you make that conscious choice, that assimilation for your people, for your family, is the best alternative to survival. That is the long-term legacy of residential schools. Canada has to be accountable. So when students or even adults walk into your place of work, come to work, that enduring legacy is there. I'm fortunate. I'm a second generation removed from the, from the residential school system. It wasn't something that we openly discussed in our family. It was something that was always there, but it wasn't something that we naturally discussed. But that legacy of trauma exists in me it's very difficult to look at even my children and think in 1921 100 years ago they would have been ripped from my arms in september to be sent to residential school my eldest is 12 she would have been in residential school for a grand total of eight years which is triple a double her um a, a two-thirds of her life my eight-year-old would have been in residential schools for four years, which would have been half of her life. And my son, because of his complex special needs, actually would have probably been taken away at diagnosis, which would have been around the age of three and institutionalized, and we never would have seen him again. And I say that honestly, because in order to get off the reserve, you needed a day pass. You needed to ask permission to leave in those days. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about generational trauma. When we're talking about truth. We're not necessarily talking about culture. We're not talking about eagle feathers or ceremonies or powwows or regalia. This is what we have to deal with. This is what Canada has to be accountable to. This is why these such forums like this, this these education assemblies are so important to have. Because we need to definitely, you need to understand that this trauma is prevalent in everything that we do. There is not a nation that has a form of residential school trauma. Now, there are some who were able to get away from it, who were able to strike deals, but at significant cost to the nations in order to keep their children. There was... To simply say, oh, well, you know, some, some nations will say, well, we didn't send people to residential schools. We managed to get out of it. And they did. But it was at definite cost, either to land, land usage, re-signing of treaties, different pressures. And we all know what happens when we sign contracts with duress. These contracts never work into the actual long-term favors of those who are signing them. So as we move forward and today, and we are finding all of these, these children who have been lost, and I, and I say that because survivors have been talking about this. Residential schools have been in operations in 1831, federally from 1870 to 1996. And the last one was actually closed. One of the last Inuit um, residential schools was closed in 1997. 
This is a long-term legacy of generational trauma. And in many cases, as, we're, as Canada is finally awakening to and seeing, that they've destroyed two out of seven generations of children, of families, of communities, of societies through this system of residential schools. So when we go into classroom, when I come into a classroom, I can't, I can't take away some of that trauma. It's, it's a part of who I am. It's a part of who my students are. But I can understand it. And I can be welcoming and understanding why sometimes certain situations can be triggers for these students. I know because I was one of those students. So when we talk about accessing, you know, how do we teach Indigenous history, I think it's important to just be truthful. Be truthful about what the history is actually being taught. There's a lot of good in Indigenous cultures, but it's not necessarily the, the public system's duty to teach that. But it is, the, it is the public system's duty to respect it. Like it is supposed to respect every single one of the many cultures who enters its doorways. Whether it be a parent walking into the main office, talking to the staff, or whether it be a custodian or a, or a teacher who has lived experiences. Those are all part of the dynamic that is now the relationship of Canada. Now, this, isn't, this is well beyond what we're talking about when we're also talking about the treaties, which is a completely different set of, or, of relationships, structured relationships. And that is a wide variety. I, I do another lecture about treaty relationships. That is a, a, a very wide variety of, of languages and uses, usages, which is always kind of interesting when we talk about Canada as well. Canada is okay with talking about treaties when it comes with other nations, trade agreements, and so on and so forth. In order for Canada to exist, it actually has to have treaties with sovereign nations, with individual groups. Canada is a very interesting um, uh, embodiment of what truth is. And, and we are not at the reconciliation phase yet. We are still simply learning the truth as these. But like I tell all my, all my great friends and allies, what's important to understand here is to be accountable to one another. We have to be willing to be accountable to each other, accountable for our actions. But most importantly, we have to listen. Our survivors have been talking about what has occurred at residential schools since the first one of those children came home after their first experiences. We have been, Canada has been told. Indigenous people have been speaking. What is important at this point now is to listen. What has happened has happened. And, and Canada must be accountable to that. So as we move forward, when we're talking about, I, I can't give you any tricks or anything like that. Though, you know, how are you going to, you know, manage somebody or how are you going to help a classroom or how are you going to teach Indigenous history? And the reason why is because there are 586 different nations on what is Turtle Island. And every one of those nations has its own history, its own culture, its own language, its own, it's, it's, it's complete beauty in its own right. And what is okay for one is not going to be okay for another. And respecting that diversity is really, I think, at the foundation of what has to happen in the public school system. Be very mindful of, of the events that you attend. Be very humbled, hopefully, when you listen and listen and you hear elders and community, excuse me, community leaders speak. They are speaking of a truth and of a perspective of Canada, which is outside of Canada, which is not a part of the system. And is part of a system which is part of a larger relationship that dates back 154 years, starting in July. Canada is very young and has much to learn from the people who have been here since time immemorable. And not everything 
will be a, a, a polite conversation. As we can see, as we can see with all the discord across, you know, Canada trying to understand its own treaty relationships. But it starts off with being quiet. It starts off by being humbled and respectful. It starts off by listening to those who have the stories to tell and then being accountable and actionable. And I know I'm talking to a bunch of unionists. I'm one as well. So being actionable is something we are very good at doing. And that is what will change the world. Is because I know and I have had the opportunity to speak to many, many people, many affiliates. And every single one of them is willing to change the world. And it takes so. And we, we always do. We have a saying here in Nipissing and, and most Anishinaabe people will say that this takes seven generations. We are only a part of that system. We only a part of the larger motion. But it is starting today. It is starting with assemblies like this. It is starting with people having conversations at their tables. Because anybody who has suffered racism will tell you, I've seen it because I don't look Anishinaabe. And, I, and it's something that I, I, my grandmother told me. But I have seen racism at the kitchen table. And that is the most dangerous form of racism. It is not the racism in the streets. It is the racism at a, someone's table. Because that's the type of racism that is shared generationally. And that is where we need to start. That's where we need our allies to stand up. That's where we need our allies to stop those conversations so that we have the space, so that we have the opportunity to stand up for ourselves later. So with those words, I hope that you guys bring forward that change. I hope that we will work together as nations, as people, who shared Turtle Island for the next center seven generations to undo the evils that has, have happened in the past. Because today is the first day of the next seven generations. And we all have that responsibility to think and work for them. So miigwech and thank you. And I hope you guys have a great assembly.